served them well enough. Their own people manifestly tolerated them. However unjustly England might be organized, it was at any rate not torn by class warfare or haunted by secret police. The empire was peaceful as no area of comparable size has ever been. Throughout its vast extent, nearly a quarter of the earth, there were fewer armed men than would have been found necessary by a minor Balkan state. As people to live under, and looking at them merely from a liberal negative standpoint, the British ruling class had their points. They were preferable to the truly modern men, the Nazis and fascists, but it had long been obvious that they would be helpless against any serious attack from the outside. They could not struggle against Nazism or fascism because they could not understand them. Neither could they have struggled against communism if communism had been a serious force in Western Europe. To understand fascism, they would have had to study the theory of socialism, which would have forced them to realize that the economic system by which they lived was unjust, inefficient, and out of date. But it was exactly this fact that they had trained themselves never to face. They dealt with fascism as the cavalry generals of 1914 dealt with the machine guns, by ignoring it. After years of aggression and massacres, they had grasped only one fact, that Hitler and Mussolini were hostile to communism. Therefore, it was argued, they must be friendly to the British dividend drawer. Hence the truly frightening spectacle of conservative MPs wildly cheering the news that British ships bringing food to the Spanish Republican government had been bombed by Italian aeroplanes. Even when they had begun to grasp that fascism was dangerous, its essentially revolutionary nature, the huge military effort it was capable of making, the sort of tactics it would use, were quite beyond their comprehension. At the time of the Spanish Civil War, anyone with as much political knowledge as can be acquired from a sixpenny pamphlet on socialism knew that if Franco won, the result would be strategically disastrous for England. And yet generals and admirals who had given their lives to the study of war were unable to grasp this fact. This vein of political ignorance runs right through English official life, through cabinet ministers, ambassadors, consuls, judges, magistrates, policemen. This policeman who arrests the Red does not understand the theories the Red is preaching. If he did, his own position as bodyguard of the money class might seem less pleasant to him. There is reason to think that even military espionage is hopelessly hampered by ignorance of the new economic doctrines and the ramifications of the underground parties. The British ruling class were not altogether wrong in thinking that fascism was on their side. It is a fact that any rich man, unless he is a Jew, has less to fear from fascism than from either communism or democratic socialism. One ought never to forget this, for nearly the whole of German and Italian propaganda is designed to cover it up. The natural instinct of men like Simon, Hoare, Chamberlain, etc., was to come to an agreement with Hitler. But, and here the peculiar feature of English life that I have spoken of, of the deep sense of national solidarity comes in, they could only do so by breaking up the empire and selling their own people into semi-slavery. A truly corrupt class would have done this without hesitation, as in France. But things had not gone that distance in England. Politicians who would make cringing speeches about the duty of loyalty to our conquerors are hardly to be found in English public life. Tossed to and fro between their incomes and their principles, it was impossible like, that men like Chamberlain should do anything but make the worst of both worlds. One thing that has always shown that the English ruling class are morally fairly sound is that in time of war they are ready enough to get themselves killed. Several dukes, earls, and whatnots were killed in the recent campaign in Flanders. That could not happen if these people were the cynical scoundrels that they are sometimes declared to be. It is important not to misunderstand their motives, or one cannot predict their actions. What is to be expected of them is not treachery or physical cowardice, but stupidity, unconscious sabotage, an infallible instinct for doing the wrong thing. They are not wicked, not altogether, not, not, or not altogether wicked, they are merely unteachable. Only when their money and power are gone will the younger among them begin to grasp what century they are living in. Thank you. And an English reading George Orwell's England, Your England. That's right. Alan, the book, and on the Wednesday rush hour at London Bridge Live Station. 
the 11th of October 2017. Thanks for watching.